let's get started. The topic for today's webinar is Adapting Test Strategies for Adaptive Beam Headlights. My name is John Clark and I'll be the moderator today. I'm pleased to say that we have three presenters representing both Intertech and the American Center for Mobility on our program. Ralph Buckingham has been working for Intertech for more than 10 years with a focus on the automotive, aerospace, and wireless industries. He spent the first five years managing laboratory operations and expanding Intertech's aerospace and automotive capabilities. Today, as a director of Intertech Transportation Technologies, he is focused on expanding Intertech's testing capabilities within the telematics, connected, and autonomous vehicle sectors. Ralph participates on various industry standard development committees contributing to the evolution of telematics, connected vehicle, and autonomous vehicle testing procedures. Our second presenter is Sam Beckett, the Proven Grounds Testing Manager at the American Center for Mobility. He coordinates all testing done at the facility and oversees all engineering efforts by the ACM team. This includes things like assisting customers in test plan development, supervising the use of all test equipment, ensuring safe practices, and of course, proper test execution. And last but not least is Nate Danks, a senior projects engineer in the Intertech Photometrics Group who specializes in automotive lighting testing. He began dynamic testing of adaptive forward lighting systems in 2018 and is involved in the SAE Lighting Committee. His background also includes EMC and radiological protection testing, and he has a bachelor's degree in physics from Calvin College. So now that we have the proper introductions made, I'm gonna turn it over to you to Ralph to get us going. Thanks a lot for that, John. Um, we'll go ahead and just talk a little bit about Intertech so everybody on the call understands uh, a little bit more about the business and, and what we can do to help, help them. Um, first, it's a global company, and we, we specialize in all things related to assurance, testing, inspection, and certification. We've got over a thousand locations and more than a hundred companies, and there's or more than a hundred countries, and there's over forty-six thousand employees within the business. We like to say that uh, we're a global company, and we've got a depth of breadth in services globally because we're both local and global. And you can see that on this next slide. This is specific just to our automotive locations. And you can see that we're really well balanced in terms of being able to offer uh, similar size and scale of services for automotive customers in um, both uh, the, the North American region, uh, Europe, and, and APAC, Asia Pacific. So uh, the, the location we're going to be talking about most uh, in this presentation is, is a part through a partnership with the American Center for Mobility here in Ypsilanti, Michigan. And we leverage our photometrics group from our photometrics test lab in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan to come out to the track here at ACM and run a lot of the adaptive headlight beam tests that we do. A little bit of background on the American Center for Mobility. Um, it's a comprehensive test environment for all new technologies and full vehicle test. We like to say that we focus on testing the brains, not just the brawn of the vehicle. Um, we've got over 500 acres of road surface here, real world road conditions. Um, a custom connected and automated vehicle test systems, a 5G network uh, is being installed through AT&T. Uh, currently, there's a 4G customizable network in place, <clears throat> and the site offers all the most recent um, advanced driver assist system test, which would be ADAS test, as well as automated vehicle test, which would be tests uh, on systems that are cutting edge and, and aren't uh, available in the commercial market yet. So a really exciting place to be. The topic today, adaptive uh, driving beam testing, we're going to cover in five different sections. The first is going to be a little, a little bit of a description of what adaptive driving beams are. So this will be sort of in layman's terms, uh, describing the technology, um, what, they're cap what the technology is capable of, and how it, how it helps people. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Nate to talk a little bit about um, what adaptive driving beams are and some of the history with regards to this technology. Uh, thank you for that, Ralph. Um, so uh, traditionally, headlamps have, uh, have formed a compromise between both illuminating the road ahead and uh, glaring other drivers. Um, 
basically the idea is that we need to be able to illuminate the road clearly so that we can see, um, but we can't cause unsafe or uncomfortable situations for oncoming or preceding traffic. Um, the adaptive driving beam uh, aims to remove that compromise by uh, essentially creating a beam where you can uh, individually dim uh, specific areas that you want to not glare. Um, Ralph, you can go ahead and go on to the next slide. Um, the uh, adaptive driving beam technology focuses on the uh, recent improvements in both uh, image recognition technology um, as well as uh, other automation sensors and uh, LED technology which has allowed us to have more control over our beam patterns uh, in a smaller package uh, which, which allows us to actually uh, have very good control over exactly where and how much light we put onto the road. Right. That's really interesting, Nate. You, really, you, you just sort of did a deep dive into that first bullet point, I think, about the improved uh, capability of the lighting systems due to the optical performance of the LEDs and microcontrollers that, that uh, control them. Um, we should ask uh, Sam here to talk a little bit about the automated technology. So I think this is an interesting um, uh, sort of combination of capability that vehicles are developing. W one side of it is coming from the, the need to be able to uh, make the vehicles more safe and, and, and allow for recognition of different risky scenarios that they can then respond to for the user. But in doing so, that recognition capability is what's enabling some of this uh, adaptive beam technology. Sam, can you talk a little bit about what we're testing? Yeah, so obviously with a lot of the newer safety features and automated driving features, a lot of that depends on the vehicle knowing about its environment around it. And so radar systems have been in vehicles for a while now for adaptive cruise control and just um, rear alert systems, other things of the sort. But this system relies more on the camera technology that we're starting to see more and more for lane departure warning and AEB systems as well. And so since there's this visual-based system, they can use that with camera recognition technology to detect the headlights or taillights and of different vehicles on the roadway and then know exactly where they are to then change the headlights appropriately. And so just with this push for more advanced safety features and automated features, more of this is available for these systems to take advantage of knowing precisely where the vehicles are on the roadway. Yep. Yeah, thanks a lot for that, Sam. Yep. And so that's that's exciting for us. We like to see when, when two technologies that we're experts at testing kind of merge to create a system like this that, that makes things safer for everybody. So looks like on this next slide, we have a pretty good illustration of, of what adaptive beam technology can do. It's, it's essentially bending the beam around this oncoming car. You want to explain a little bit about what we're seeing here, Nate? Yeah, sure. So, so the idea here is that there's uh, in this in this particular system, essentially, there's a, a 10 by 10 grid of LEDs um, that are each independently uh, intensity controlled. Uh, and inside of the the vehicle, there is some type of a, a sensor. We'll we'll assume that it's a, a camera-based sensor that sees uh, the oncoming vehicle, um, and then it's identified exactly exactly where that oncoming vehicle is, as well as the preceding vehicle up ahead there. Um, and it's created essentially uh, cones of light um, or uh, I guess darkness uh, around those vehicles so it doesn't glare those oncoming drivers. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's able to illuminate uh, the road directly ahead of the, um, of the driver as well as the road to the side, to the left and to the right, um, where you may see things like pedestrians or deer uh, or other potential issues that, that you, you traditionally can only uh, see clearly with your high beams. Yep. Well, wow, that's actually really interesting. The first time I looked at this image, Nate, I didn't realize it was dimming um, the pattern of light behind that vehicle that it was following as well. But yeah, it's doing two things at once, right? So yeah, pretty interesting technology it kind of, so that that image sort of highlights the benefit right of this type of technology a, a, a roadway that's more visible um, is a safer roadway for people and this is technology that allows the vehicle to illuminate only the parts of the of the roadway that the user needs to see 
and avoid essentially glare and, and putting bright light into the eyes of other, other folks and making it so they can't see, right? Um, anything to build on that thought, Nate? Are there other uh, benefits that I haven't uh, talked through there? No, I mean, that's that's basically the idea, right? It, it allows the drivers uh, to um, to have better visibility of the roadway um, and at the same time prevents the drivers from uh, causing issues for other other drivers. Um, and that that's that's the kind of the gold standard here is we we want to we want to do the best we possibly can. Um, and it, oh, sorry not to interrupt, but it, 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 we did mention vehicle to vehicle type uh, illumination, but are there systems that can recognize uh, vulnerable road users as well and dim the pattern of light that may um, potentially disrupt their vision? Yeah, so we've, we've, seen, um, we've seen some uh, proposed designs that include um, what we would call um, adaptive spotlighting, which uh, essentially creates a, a spot of light instead of a spot of darkness to highlight specific features on the road um, that they may want to, uh, that the vehicle may want to alert the driver of. Um, for example, if there's a pedestrian on the roadway like there is in the image here, um, the adaptive spot could uh, follow that pedestrian so that the driver of the vehicle is aware of the pedestrian. Um, that that technology is a little bit different than our, our typical uh, adaptive forward lighting or adaptive driving beam technology. Um, and it's still being studied to determine whether or not um, that is effective at actually alerting the driver to issues or if the distraction that the, uh, the moving spot um, creates is actually uh, problematic. Oh, that's very interesting. So, so yeah, it's uh, it's maybe not not always the best course of action to make the lights do too much because it may distract you from your driving task. You know, okay. All right. Well, thanks for that, guys. I think that uh, does a really good job of explaining every, everything. But uh, again, we, we welcome people that are listening to uh, go ahead and send us any questions through the chat if we didn't cover something you're, you're, uh, you're still having some thoughts on. All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the SAE J3069 specification and some of the adaptive beam testing that we've, we've done uh, to this specification. So Nate, why don't you start by giving us an overview of 3069 and some of the, the requirements that are in it? Sure. So obviously we, we've talked through, you know, what the technology is and um, what the benefits of it are, but but at the same time, it's it's fairly easy to see that that regulating this technology and controlling this technology is difficult because in order for this technology to work, there have to be a lot of different variables that are all working together. For example, the aim of the beam. Uh, has to be correct. And uh, when the vision image recognition technology decides it wants to dim a specific area, it has to actually dim that area, um, which means that the uh, image recognition has to be very well tuned to the actual optical technology that's in the headlamps. So to try and tackle this, um, the uh, SAE uh, formed a, a task force to uh, put together a regulation that they believed would uh, effectively test uh, an adaptive forward lighting system or an adaptive driving beam uh, in order to ensure that the resulting adaptive driving beam uh, both uh, provides good performance uh, in terms of illumination as well as acceptable performance in terms of glare for other vehicles. Uh, so the SAE task force combines recommendations from uh, industry experts, from OEM suppliers, test labs, regulatory bodies, uh, from both Europe, uh, Canada, uh, China, um, and other places that, that my, my brain isn't uh, quick enough to think of right now. Um, and it, it is essentially a complete set of tests, uh, including our, our basic component level um, physical tests, uh, all the way up through uh, dynamic uh, on-road testing to uh, to completely validate that the resulting adaptive driving beam system is adequate. Yep, yep. and that fair and balanced approach, uh, the intent there is to make sure that all the right stakeholders weigh in, right? So that's that's great insight, and thanks thanks a lot for that, Nate. Um, 
with regards to what we've done to execute some of the testing that's specified in 3069 uh, here at the American Center for Mobility, um, using your support from the Grand Rapids Lighting Lab there, Nate, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the setup that's pictured here at left on the left and um, some of the nuances regarding setting it up and taking some of these complex measurements. Right, so um, in order to, to basically fully validate that the system actually works and that the adaptive driving beam creates, um, creates an acceptable level of glare, uh, the SAE 3069 decided on a dynamic test which uses um, uh, test drives uh, and stimulus vehicle fixtures. The stimulus vehicle fixtures are fixed in that they, they, they don't move, right? They, they go into a single spot and then their dynamic test includes a 155 meter test section. Uh, that 155 meters is uh, essentially the, the length or duration that the uh, original um, high beam uh, intensity, max intensities were set based on um, dimming at uh, 500 feet or 155 meters. Uh, and then it uses lux measurements at uh, typical driver's eye locations uh, for uh, a, a, diff, a different um, uh, different group or different uh, stimulus vehicle in order to establish uh, whether or not the glare level from that headlamp is acceptable. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. So yeah, it sounds like a, a fairly complex setup, and we we have an interesting question here that's maybe a less less complex question. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you this one now, Nate, because um, we touched a little bit on dimming the pattern of light that's that's potentially going to um, illuminate another vehicle or get into another driver's eyes. And we talked a little bit about the pedestrian scenario, and you mentioned that you don't necessarily want a, the lights doing a lot because it may distract the driver when they uh, spotlight certain things and, and don't spotlight others. But the question that came in was, will the technology be useful in preventing crashes involving cars and wild animals? So I wonder, ha has any discussion beyond just pedestrians and other vehicles been had on the SAE committee to date? Have they talked about deer, uh, deer, dogs, things like that, that might get in the roadway? Yeah. Um, so that that's actually one of the primary safety benefits, at least in theory, of, of the uh, adaptive driving beam technology is that uh, things like, like deer, cow, other large wild animals, other things that uh, may be in the roadway that uh, wouldn't normally be in the roadway that a driver would need to respond quickly to, uh, and specifically having a higher level of illumination would help with. Um, the, uh, the SAE committee has frequently discussed, um, you know, what is the safety benefit of better headlights, of brighter headlights? Uh, you know, what are the safety detriments of glare? Um, these, these are, these are things that are discussed all the time. And there's, there's, uh, there's kind of a universal consensus that more light is better. Um, and then there's a mixed feeling about whether or not glare is problematic. So some people, some people will take the stance that there's never been a, a proven safety detriment to glare. Um, and, uh, other people will take the stance that the, uh, the glare thresholds were set the way they were for a reason. Um, and that, uh, glare can be or or would be detrimental if we allowed the glare levels to increase. Interesting. Interesting. So it is somewhat of a trade-off, it sounds like, in terms of how much you light up the roadway. Too much yeah. might not be good enough, might might definitely be bad. Well so in terms of lighting up the roadway, you know, more is more is better. Um, but there are uh, laws of uh, diminishing return because uh, Illumination intensity goes as the inverse square of distance. So you can pump more and more power into the into the lights, but but your distance that you can actually see goes as the square root of that. Yeah, interesting. We have a, a, a somewhat deeper technical question that probably also falls in line with this this slide on bullet point three. You mentioned lux measurements, and somebody asked, um, "Do you know or remember the lux levels that are used to establish glare limits?" Um, I, uh, I, I have an idea. Um, I know that the lux levels were based on the, uh, the glare lines that are established in, uh, FMVSS 108. 
Um, I know that at 155 meters for a, an oncoming vehicle, the lux limit somewhere around 0.3 or 0.4 lux. Um, and then the lux levels increase as you come closer. Interesting. Um, Interesting. Well, I think that's a pretty darn good answer for not having the document right in front of you, Nate. Thanks for that. I figured it'd be a, a, a pretty tricky question to answer off the top of your head. All right, we'll move on to the next slide here. Oh, sorry about that. There we go. Okay. So the next the next few slides that we're going to go over talk a little bit about the 3069 standard or requirement, and then they talk about some of the nuances in setting up and actually performing the test to spec. And so. Uh, through some of the experience that we've had, we have, we thought it'd be valuable to tell people a little bit about some of the specifics as far as how we accomplish these tests uh, here at ACM using uh, the photometrics team. So, Nate, why don't you start us? Uh, talk us through the stimulus fixtures um, that we built and, and why we built them the way we did to accommodate uh, the 3069 requirement. Sure. So, um, when when we uh, when we first decided to tackle this uh, this particular specification. Um, we recognize that in the standard, the, uh, the stimulus light sources are supposed to be held at a specific location relative to the illuminant sensors. Um, so we built fixtures that uh, rigidly hold um, each of these components at the relative location uh, to one another, uh, which, which basically just helps to ensure that we always hold the illuminant sensors at the correct location and at the same location relative to uh, the stimulus light sources. Um, we designed and built uh, four fixtures, one for each of the, the different uh, fixtures that are described in SAE 3069. Um, and then we also designed and built uh, stimulus sources that we, uh, we verified using our photometry equipment here uh, to meet the intensity area and uniformity requirements. And then in our fixtures, uh, we have uh, detector mounts, which allow us to uh, to quickly change from fixture to fixture. So, um, in the course of uh, of a test run over over a night, uh, it takes you know, approximately one minute uh, to switch from, uh, for example, fixture one to fixture four, um, which means that we spend less time setting up and uh, more time evaluating the uh, the performance of the vehicle. Yeah, that's great. That's great insight, Nate. So essentially more more efficiency because it's not just what you do, it's how you do it. So yeah, I'm glad to hear we're able to do that. It looks like the fixture on the previous slide uh, was a motorcycle, correct? So you're saying you can switch from, for example, a motorcycle to a passenger car really quickly with, with our setup? Uh, yeah, yeah. So we we are able to, to fairly quickly move from that, uh, that preceding motorcycle fixture there to uh, for example, the uh, the oncoming um, uh, passenger vehicle fixture. All right, we'll go ahead and move on. So let's talk a little bit about the the test drives. And uh, Sam, you can probably weigh in and talk a little bit about what what locations we use here on the site at ACM to do this testing and why, because I think a lot of it has to do with ambient background light and that's something that's not easily controlled yeah so obviously when you were testing these systems we want to minimize any other light other than the test vehicle itself and so that can be kind of limiting for a lot of different locations if there are street lights or traffic lights um, any sort of building lights um, other vehicles in the area but also just reflective sources from any metallic objects or road signs um, other things of that sort. So we've got a few different locations around our property here where we're mostly isolated from the exterior, the outside world, um, for any street lights or other vehicles or things like that. So it blocks a lot of ambient light. And then um, just for the test, we need to have a long straight stretch of road, which we have several of here around property. And so mostly we're just trying to uh, cover up any of those metallic sources we have around property. But uh, Pretty easy to do. Uh, haven't been too many issues. Um, and anything else to that point from you, Nate? Yeah. So 
so just to explain a little bit about the, the issue with ambient light, uh, when you're using a cam camera based image recognition solution, uh, it's essentially impossible to tell the difference between, uh, for example, a fixed uh, stoplight like a like a um, like a uh, traffic light um, that's uh, red uh, as compared to a fixed uh, tail light um, that you might see on a single motorcycle. Um, because of that, uh, any sources of ambient light um, can potentially cause issues for image recognition based systems. Um, and in the SAE 3069 test set, they're using fixtures that are, are static. The fixtures aren't moving, um, which means that the image recognition system can't use um, the type of uh, the type of logic that it might use to uh, identify a moving object compared to a static object. Yeah, that's interesting. So is it necessarily that darker is, is better or it, you know, or is it more realistic is better? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know if strictly speaking darker is, is better. Uh, I know that, that from, from the people that I've worked with, uh, their opinion has been uh, almost universally that less distraction for the camera means better performance of the camera. Um, does more realistic mean, um, uh, sorry. Uh, so in, in terms of camera performance, adding the the variable of a moving source versus a static source gives it something else that it can use, um, which is, I think, historically why um, one of the comments that was made or has been made uh, when looking at uh, dynamic test methods that use a dynamic fixture um, has been that it, image recognition systems struggle more with static sources uh, or static okay. fixtures. Yeah, and it, it it it's understandable as to why. Yeah, and I I did I did ask ask the question and and intentionally stump you a little bit because it's a question that we get asked a lot about all of our testing, you know, and and ultimately we want consistent, reliable, repeatable tests, but also we have to account for the fact that the world is inherent inherently unreliable and inconsistent, right? And we've had some customers come out and even request that we test only in a new moon. Isn't that right? Yes. Yep. So yeah. in order to reduce variability as much as, as, as possible, um, we've, we've restricted essentially all of the variables that we can possibly control, uh, including the lunar calendar. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, and we've got a, an interesting question. I, I don't know if this is one that we will be able to interpret as correctly as written, but let's let's go ahead and address it on this slide since it's similar to what we're talking about. Um, the question that came in is, um, what is the relationship of ABD lights to the standard photometric figures? And so can the limits be exceeded and minimized? So it, it sounds like they're asking if the traditional limits or requirements for lighting can be can be changed based on this technology. So that's that's certainly um, a certainly a, a possibility. Uh, if you look at some of the the major um, the major contributors to both comments for new regulations as well as uh, SAE, uh, that's something that's been discussed. But but based on the current proposed uh, regulations and recommended practice. Um, the basic idea is that we we have essentially two beams within the headlamp. We have a fully compliant lower beam and a fully compliant upper beam, and all beam conditions are somewhere in between those two beams. Mm -hmm. So basically, we turn on or off parts of the upper beam um, in order to uh, create the adaptive driving beam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. So great. Yeah, great insight. And, and thanks for the question, whoever asked that. So let's talk a little bit about data acquisition. So we, we talked about the environment. We talk, talked about the test stand and the reconfigurability that you guys incorporated into it. But what we didn't get into was how we collect the data, what types of sensors are used and why. And so why don't you start, Nate, and then we'll defer to um, Sam on some of the RTKD GPS capability we have here on site. 
So um, in order to actually evaluate the glare uh, dynamically, you need to collect the uh, illuminance data or lux data uh, very quickly. Uh, SAE 3069 requires uh, a 10 hertz data collection rate, um, but what we've what we've found is that uh, as as the vehicle is moving, uh, a tenth of a second is um, could be um, as much as three or four meters in space, um, because the vehicle could be moving as much as um, you know thirty meters per second, um, which means that a, a ten hertz data collection rate isn't adequate. Um, but at the same time. Um, if you uh, collect data too much faster than 10 hertz, um, you can see things in your data like the on or off of pulse width modulated light sources, uh, which frequently adaptive driving beams use pulse width modulation to control the intensity of portions of the beam. Uh, if you don't know what pulse width modulation is, basically they're rapidly turning on and off um, parts of the LEDs. Uh, and that creates to a very fast photometric sensor, uh, a square wave or an on-off wave. But to our eyes, um, we see it as a dimmed light source because our eyes only respond at um, uh, what's called the flicker fusion uh, frequency. Um, so basically anything, anything faster than a certain frequency, our eyes see as continuous. Um, so what we do in order to, to meet this balance is we collect data at a thousand hertz, uh, which is which is fast enough to um, uh, to achieve uh, good granularity over the test drive, and then we do a boxcar average. So we 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 average uh, down to an effective frequency of ten hertz. So what that means is if you have a pulse width modulation that's uh, that's steady, we see the average intensity uh, the same way that our eyes do. Um, but if there's a, an upward or downward trend, we see that within um, within one millisecond. Interesting. Yeah, in interesting. So, so essentially, you wouldn't, you know, without some of this insight that you just mentioned, you might think that you can just go out and collect data at a 10 hertz rate, but really you'd run into some of the, the pulse width mod modulation challenges you just mentioned if you did it that way, right? Uh, you could potentially. It, it it depends on exactly how the sensor works. But it, it would be possible to um, to collect data at a 10 hertz rate and um, have uh, have measurements that are uh, wildly inaccurate. Right. Um, right. And then to add to that, we uh, simultaneously are able at the ACM to collect data from uh, from a, a a GPS system that's connected to the RTK base station. And allows 100 hertz GPS measurements with a nominal two centimeter accuracy, which is um, 100 times better than is required by uh, the test standard. And like we mentioned earlier, uh, at a 10 hertz rate, uh, we may have motion of as high as three to four meters, which doesn't allow accuracy to two meters um, in distance, uh, at least yeah. in theory. Um, so having the 100 hertz rate allows us to actually identify exactly where the vehicle is in time. Uh, uh, and then in addition to the GPS, we also have uh, gates that we set at specific distances along the test track, um, which allows us to see uh, instantaneously exactly when the vehicle passed um, specific distance points. Um, which basically allows us to uh, process the data uh, on the spot. Whereas yeah. uh, if, if you needed to combine the, um, the GPS data with the illuminance data, uh, that would need to be done as a post process uh, after the fact. Right, right, that's, that's uh, really interesting. And it's, it's uh, convenient too that we have that RTK capability here at ACM for a lot of the other tests that we do. So we're able to incorporate it into this test setup and provide a, it sounds like a level of data acquisition that's beyond the requirement of the standard. Uh, let's talk a little bit, you mentioned earlier the, uh, the static test fixtures, uh, but there is one, uh, fi there is one requirement in 3069 at least that requires a sudden appearance. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this uh, sudden appearance variant type test where um, it looks like the motorcycle fixture needs to suddenly appear, appear in front of the subject vehicle? Yes, so 
um, basically one of the uh, one of the potential problem points for ADB systems is when um, a vehicle suddenly appears because of uh, rounding a corner or cresting a hill um, or if the uh, driver turns onto the roadway, uh, the oncoming or preceding driver turns onto the roadway in front of you. Um, and in order to evaluate that, the uh, SAE committee decided to use um, basically the, the fixed fixture with the light source off and then have it suddenly appear at 155 meters distant. Um, we built on the, uh, the the beam block type of gates that we had uh, used to determine the position in time. Um, and then we have that remotely trigger the light at 155 meters, um, which allows us to have very good repeatability in terms of exactly when on any given test drive or where on any given test drive um, that uh, that sudden appearance variant um, turns on. The, the standard does allow you to turn it on at any distance between, I think it's 155 and 120 meters. Um, so there is some variability, which I, I, I suspect they did so that you could manually turn, um, you could manually turn that light source on. But we found that if you use an automated method, you have much better repeatability. Yeah, yeah. So the bottom line is, by holding ourselves to a little bit tighter tolerance on this, we're giving people a, a more repeatable test, right? Uh, yes, that's that's correct. All right, let's talk about the regulations. Um, uh, we've got a couple of different uh, regulations that have been based around uh, tests that are different or uh, not the same as what's what's specified in 3069. Um, and, and that would be the NHTSA proposed rule and the UN reg. So first, just building on 3069, I know we talked about it pretty extensively, but um, give us a little bit of uh, the, the requirement, uh, the high level you know, overview of the requirement, Nate, as it relates to some of the regulations. Yep, so, so basically after the uh, SAE published the document, um, that, same, uh, that same year or maybe the year after, uh, Transport Canada uh, issued a, an update to their um, uh, to their uh, regulation um, for automotive lights, which historically um, Transport Canada has has basically just followed exactly what the United States does, um, which because of geographical location and because of how um, how uh, how related the two countries are, that that makes a ton of sense. Um, but when they did that, they incorporated SAE 3069 as an alternative uh, headlamp uh, allowance. So basically any adaptive driving beam that complies to SAE 3069 um, is legal or permitted in Canada. Um, outside of that, SAE 3069 isn't incorporated in any current regulatory structure, um, but there is the, there is the possibility um, that with the uh, ge geographical proximity um, and with SAE 3069 compliant beams, um, being introduced in Canada, that uh, this will have an influence on the uh, the U.S. regulatory structure. Yeah, and thus far, it looks like the the NPRM specifies some requirements that are different than 3069. So it would at least hint that that possibly the U.S. requirement might differ from the Canadian requirement. Essentially, is that correct? Yeah. So so in October 2018, the U.S. NHTSA uh, issued a proposed rulemaking uh, for adaptive driving beams, and they considered uh, both the UN Reg 123 and UN regulatory structure for adaptive driving beams, as well as the SAE 3069 approach. Um, and they decided that, that neither one was adequate, and so they proposed their own method for um, uh, regulatory and the, or regulating adaptive driving beams. Um, just to kind of compare this to the SAE 3069, uh, one of the one of the big differences is that uh, in the U.S. proposed NPRM, they're using dynamic stimulus vehicles. So um, basically, any uh, any uh, current model vehicle or any anything within the last I think five years um, can be used as a stimulus vehicle, uh, which 
uh, makes it fairly simple to come up with a stimulus vehicle if you're um, if you're testing uh, the parts, but at the same time, it gives NHTSA the ability to uh, cause a failure if if somebody identifies that you know the it doesn't work with the Fiat 500, right? Uh, but it works just fine on all other passenger vehicles. Um, the NHTSA can uh, test it with the Fiat 500 and say, yeah, your your ADB system fails. What are you guys going to do about it? Interesting. Um, so they're really putting putting the onus on the manufacturer to make sure that the technology works regardless of vehicle that that it's seeing. Yes. Yep. So this this is this is one of the issues that's brought up in some of the comments is that they've allowed uh, essentially infinite variability. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So beyond that, they uh, the NHTSA NPRM um, because of the fact that we're we're doing a fully dynamic test with both a dynamic stimulus and a dynamic ADB vehicle, um, they have incorporated uh, a wider variety of uh, turn radiuses and speeds. Um, as well as uh, uh, straight sections that are already incorporated. Um, so I think the number of test drives goes from somewhere around 24 in SAE 3069 to uh, hundreds in the uh, NPRM, and that's for a single stimulus vehicle. Uh, so if you're if you're validating, you know, tens or hundreds of stimulus vehicles because of the fact that you, you do need to understand whether it works for commercial vehicles, um, small vehicles, motorcycles, mid-sized vehicles, uh, LED headlamps versus uh, uh, halogen headlamps, uh, projector headlamps versus reflector headlamps. You know, each of these look and behave differently and may perform differently with an image recognition system. Right, right, yeah, and and so it really puts uh, the manufacturer in a in a in a tight in a tight spot because you can't just come to a testing company like ourselves and say, um, can you help me comply with this or can you prove that I comply to it? I mean, the only way for us to say for sure would be to test with every possible combination of vehicles, right? Which is is uh, you know that will that will take an infinite amount of time because there is infinite variability. But yep. uh, they could come to a third-party test lab like us, and, and we could uh, we could prove it for a single stimulus vehicle uh, and a limited set of test drives. Yeah, or help them identify the edge cases and evaluate those. Um, the next, uh, the the final regulation is the U UN regulation. So this is what they're doing in Europe, and this looks completely different, right, from from what we're doing here and, and what's being done in Canada. It's essentially a test drive. And so, can you tell us a little bit about why they did this and and how it's different? Right, so so in the UN, they uh, use a type approval regulatory structure. Uh, this is fundamentally different from um, what we have in the US, which is called a, a self-certify regulatory system. So uh, in, in Europe, uh, uh, automotive parts are approved by uh, essentially a government authority um, for any one of the participating countries that has the uh, capabilities um, established for given types. Um, and so that government actually approves the part to be compliant with that type. Um, because of that regulatory structure and because of the fact that um, they have uh, an installation or essentially a vehicle level approval for a, a number of different types, uh, uh, this allows them to have a government witness uh, actually do a test drive with the vehicle and the requirement is that the test drive needs to comprise of any situation that's relevant to the system control on the basis of the applicant's description. So um, this means that the applicant, so maybe maybe it's a, a, an OE uh, like Ford or Hyundai um, will say, you know, this is how the system works and that test drive needs to actually evaluate all of the critical variables to that system um, now, obviously, this means that the uh, the level of validation here is limited to uh, the imagination of the applicant uh, that's putting together, you know, what the critical variables are for how the system works, as well as the um, the uh, individual witness that uh, does the test drive and uh, how rigorous that witness is. Right, right. Yeah, many, many uncontrolled variables, right? And and a lot of variability in the environment, too, that's not controlled. So it's a very different structure from what we have here. 
and, yeah. and, and so essentially all three, Canada, U.S., and, and uh, Europe are all going in slightly different directions, possibly with the U.S. and Canada meeting in the middle, so to speak, if the U.S. adopts some of 3069, mm -hmm. ultimately. Yeah, that, uh, that may be a, a possible thing that the uh, United States decides to do. Yeah. All right, so why test at Intertech and at the American Center for Mobility? Um, we talked about this a lot. We pointed out some of the capabilities and how we build on the requirement to ensure that we, we meet the intent of it in the most rigorous way. Um, but essentially, the expertise, the you know, people that you just heard from today, Sam and Nate, are, are a great reason to do, do your work with us here. Um, these folks have a lot of experience, and we stay on the cutting edge of all this test capability. We also have the benefit of having both the light lab and the fully capable um, automated and connected vehicle test track access. That's a sort of unique combination for most companies. Um, and lastly, third-party reliability. So um, it's, it's, you know, it's always good to have a partner when you're working to ensure that you're compliant to the regulations um, within the country that you're selling in. And we're an experienced partner that can help you have that assurance that you're going to go to market with something that's safe, reliable, and in conformance with all the requirements. A little bit of a summary for those that might have joined late. So uh, we talked today about adaptive beam technology. We gave an overview of what it is. We talked about the testing processes and how we accomplish those tests here on site at the American Center for Mobility with, with collaboration with our photometrics lab. And then lastly, we talked about uh, the most recent regulations um, and the different requirements that countries are adopting in order to ensure that these systems are safe when they're put on the road. We've had some really good questions come in today. And so um, we'll take a little bit of time now to address some of those. Um, John, I'll invite you to let us know just how much time we have and uh, help us a little bit with the prioritization of these questions. Great. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for uh, the questions that were submitted, and thanks to the guys for uh, answering those as, as we came along. Uh, we are running actually right on time, so we've got about 10 minutes. Uh, do you want me to ask you some of the outstanding questions, Ralph, or would you prefer to, to uh, take a look at some of those I might have sent over already? I'm happy to take a quick look and read a few of them off right now. If, uh, apologies in advance if we're not able to get to all of them, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. Uh, the first one here is, are you currently able to test to the NPRM? And I think the person that asked this question probably picked up on the fact that there's a lot that needs to be defined in order to ensure compliance to the NPRM based on our discussion. There could be a unlimited number of vehicles and scenarios that you test but Nate what are your thoughts and what what have you done for companies that are looking into how what they can do to be compliant sure so as far as the uh, the data acquisition systems uh, at the ACM with the RTK uh, base station and the GPS data acquisition um, as well as with the uh, the Illuminance data acquisition that we've we've set up uh, we can um, we can execute test drives. Um, some of the challenges with the NPRM is that there's a wide range of speed and curve radiuses. Now, Sam will know a little bit more about uh, what, what options there are at the track. And this is something that we've discussed uh, with a few different people um, as well. Um, but we do have some limitations with the, the, the curve radiuses and speeds. Um, in, in some cases, we can't hit every possible curve radius within uh, within the range, uh, and some of them uh, driving the, the curve radius that's specified at the speed that's specified, um, we may not feel comfortable that it's actually safe, um, just simply because we don't have um, uh, an adequate uh, an adequate track surface for that curve radius um, to drive at that speed and uh, have the allowance for something to go wrong. Uh, right. without you know killing people so there are some edge cases if you will that we we potentially want to de-risk before we we run any of that type of testing on on site and sam do you want to talk a little bit about the process we use to evaluate needs for customers and identify those potential risks and then get approval to do testing through our chief engineers yeah um 
So at ACM, we just uh, need to know the basics of the vehicle maneuvers and speeds and curves. And so obviously we can pull that from the NTRM itself and just evaluate them and locate the different locations on property where we may be able to run those tests and identify potential risks and hazards in those areas and with those maneuvers. And then um, we go over an initial evaluation if it's within, so there's already certain set tolerances and acceptable maneuvers and speeds on the different surfaces. And so if it goes above those, then we'd have to escalate that to one of our chief engineers for recommendations on safety measures for either attenuators or um, modifications to certain aspects just to be able to run those safely for everybody and everything involved. Um, so yeah, we, we try to fit everything in that we possibly can and try to squeeze things in, but we obviously want to make sure that it's done safely and uh, as best yeah. as possible. Great. Thanks for that, Sam. So I think that's a, a fairly robust answer and, and we're hope we're happy to discuss with whomever asked that question offline to, um, to help them meet meet the objective if that's what they're looking to do. Um, the next question that we have is, could could the same headlamps with pulse width mo modulation be used as daytime running lights, DRL? And so Nate, I'll ask you uh, to, to take a stab at that question. I'm not sure if I am interpreting it correctly, but what, what are your thoughts on what the what the asker is looking for here? Yeah, so, so the answer is yes. Um, uh, the uh, the current regulation permits for uh, lower beam headlamps to be used as DRLs or upper beam headlamps uh, dimmed, uh, provided that they meet certain um, uh, intensity requirements. The U.S. requirement uh, has a maximum intensity of uh, 7,000 candela for an upper beam used as a DRL uh, and 3,000 candela uh, for any other DRL. Um, there's a fair amount of what's the word, dislike um, about the fact that there's a different intensity limit for upper beams uh, in uh, certain parts of the SAE committees um, because uh, those uh, those upper beams are uh, potentially, or not upper beams, those DRLs are potentially glaring and the whole rest of the world um, has uh, um, upper beam limits or DRL maximum intensity limits that are at 2,500 candela. Um, so in the U.S. it's actually very common to validate to the SAE 2087 DRL requirements, um, which you could completely accomplish using a, a dimmed um, adaptive driving beam or using the, the beam from an ADB operated with the correct PWM levels. Oh, interesting. Okay, great, great. Thanks, thanks for that, Nate. The next question on here, um, is with pulse width modulation, does the light from the specific LED appear to dim? So I think the, the questioner is asking if the vehicle switches different LEDs on and off, or does it dim by switching the same one on and off rapidly? So um, I, I guess I don't I don't have an image, but um, it's fairly common for uh, matrix beams or, or beams that are created by uh, arrays of LEDs. Uh, to be done behind a, a projector type optic. Um, and essentially it'd be like staring into a, a slide projector or into a, a movie projector, right? Um, when you look at that projector, number one, it, it's, it's too bright to be comfortable if you stare directly at it. But number two, uh, your eyes can't resolve um, the, the really, really small uh, light sources that are changing um, behind that projector optic. So Yes, in theory, uh, the individual LED would appear to dim, but, but it, the system would be too small for any normal human at any normal viewing distance to actually see that. Oh, okay, okay. Um, another question was asked about adaptive beam technology, and it's an interesting one. I'm not sure who to address it to, because I think Sam will have some good insight into this and some thoughts on it, and I think you will too, Nate. But essentially what was asked here was, is adaptive beam technology important for autonomous vehicles? I have some thoughts on this one too, so I might weigh in. But <laughs> Sam, why don't you kick us off? Um, so my initial thought on this is that the adaptive beam technology is trying to create the trade-off of not interfering with other drivers on the road while giving the driver of the vehicle the best possible view of the road itself. And so from that point of view, if we're starting to give control 
from the driver to the vehicle itself in an autonomous fashion, then the adaptive beams aren't going to be as important for the autonomous vehicle because it's relying less on the sight of the driver itself. However, we're not really there yet with autonomous vehicles. And so this is more of an active safety feature or an advanced safety feature, which are becoming much more common on vehicles. And so it's more of an assisted driver feature rather than an autonomous feature. Right. And and you make a good point. It's the eyesight of the individual that's being thought of in the development of the adaptive beam technology, not necessarily the eyesight of the car. Mm-hmm. And the camera location may not be where your eyes are located. It's probably going to be close, somewhere in the visor area, right? Um, so, but but it begs the question: If this question were asked differently, um, and another way to ask it might be: Could you develop an adaptive beam technology that better accommodates the vehicle's ability ability to see the road? Mm-hmm. And then you would probably answer differently. Yeah. So for the yeah, I'm not sure how. Yeah, to it's, not, it's, that. A, it's a little bit of a, a, a brain teaser, but it's a good question to whomever ask it. Uh, Nate, what are what are your thoughts? Is adaptive beam technology important for autonomous vehicles? So, um, I, my opinion, the answer is yes, and, and part of it is the fact that we're not there yet with autonomous vehicles. So, uh, the reality is that being able to see what's on the road is critical for the driver, and in particular. Um, if the driver can see something that the automation doesn't recognize, like like a like a deer or, or something that doesn't make sense, that any image recognition or radar technology isn't going to be able to respond to appropriately, the driver needs to be able to see it. And the adaptive beam allows us to do that um, without causing issues for other people. Now, obviously, yep. if everything is completely uh, automated, eventually it doesn't matter if other people are being glared. But the reality is that we're not there yet, and we're not going to be there probably not within my lifetime. Um, but because of that, this is a technology that works with the driver. And at least during my lifetime, I expect that the driver will always be a critical component of autonomous vehicles. Um, that said, I don't know I don't know if we're, we're really truly looking at fully autonomous vehicles, in which case. Um, yeah. Fully I'm autonomous also just... vehicles maybe aren't as important. <laughs> So I'm also, yeah, while we're still in this intermediary phase of like partial automation, I'm also thinking about it from the flip side now, where if the automated vehicle is potentially being glared by another vehicle on the road, and that way the adaptive beams from that other vehicle would then limit the glare in any visual sensors on the autonomous vehicle. And so in that sense, it could be important to help make sure that you're not glaring camera sensors on the autonomous vehicles and causing issues with their lane keeping or other features. Yep. Yeah, and the question, the answer to the question might change depending on what level of automation you're talking about, which is what you guys are getting at too. Is it, is, are we talking fully automated? Or are we talking partially automated? Level zero? Or are we talking level five? What, what, are, we, what are we asking? So exactly. great question and, and a, a lively debate, I think, from the panelists on that one. <laughs> Um, let's see. Uh, any other questions? We're we're close to out of time. Yeah, so, we John. Are actually, uh, yeah, we are actually right at the top of our uh, scheduled ending time. Uh, you guys have done a fabulous job of providing information to everybody today, to answering the questions, and certainly uh, thanks to everyone who did submit some questions because we got some great answers and, and some great insight from our experts. Um, you know, at this point, I just want to say thank you to everybody who did join us online. You know, we certainly appreciate your taking the time out to attend this webinar, and we appreciate your interest in the topic. So hopefully we rewarded that with a, a useful and informative presentation for you today. I, I want to sp- give a special thanks to Ralph, to Sam, and, and to Nate for sharing their knowledge with everybody. And uh, as I close it out, as, as a final reminder, all attendees, uh, just remember you will be getting an email in a couple of days with links to the recording of today's presentation as well as to the slides. Uh, so this will conclude today's program. Again, thank you for attending. Everybody have a very, very wonderful day.